Hello, my name's Louise Baldock. So I'm here to talk to you about DNA today, about what it is, about how we can use it to identify biological family, how we can use it to verify our family history that we've already undertaken, our research, and how we can use it to break through some of those difficult brick walls that we might have. I'm a professional DNA genealogist. I have clients who are looking mostly for their fathers, sometimes their mothers, occasionally for their grandparents. Or sometimes they just can't determine which of several particular choices of men in a village were their ancestors and they want my help to show them which line they need to go up. But I didn't always be a professional. I started off as an amateur family historian when I was 18 and that's quite a long time ago. Mum and I decided that it would be something that we could enjoy doing together. Over the decades, Mum and I pretty much exhausted our family tree. We'd been down every line and every branch that we could. We'd gone back as far as we could. We'd gone sideways as far as we could. We'd found those ancestors whose brothers and sisters emigrated to America or who got involved in the Corn Law riots. We'd really exhausted our own family history and so we started to work on the family histories of our friends and colleagues and neighbours and in-laws and the friends and colleagues and neighbours of our in-laws and really we were running out of interesting material and that's where DNA really came in for me so when I was 50 I thought I'll have a DNA test and that would be really interesting so I took a DNA test I'll just tell you a little bit about that so you order it online and a little box comes a couple of weeks later in the post it's a little bit like doing a lateral flow test, to be honest. Only you spit in the tube rather than poke anything up your nose. But fairly similar in as much as there's little bits of plastic and tubes and bits to tear off. I put the box back in the post and registered on, on the Ancestry website that it was my saliva so that they would know when it arrived <laughs> whose it was. And then I waited and eventually I got an email I think it probably took about six to eight weeks for my results to come through. And, and the, those results were in two parts. Firstly, there were details of my ethnicity. That's what people will be familiar with from television adverts for DNA tests, and I'll come to that shortly. But what really excited me was to discover that my sample had been compared with millions of others in the database who had coincidentally also taken a DNA test. And from there, a list had been generated of people with whom I shared some identical DNA. DNA that I must have inherited from the same ancestors as them. There was even a handy search tool where I could search for anyone who had, for example, the Baldock surname on their tree. And that all made perfect sense and I could see how useful this would be in proving the accuracy of the parts of my family tree. And that was precisely why I'd taken the test and I was delighted that it would be helpful with that. I moved then to look in detail at the ethnicity report. From my family tree understanding, I was expecting to be 15 16 English, say 94%, because I had 15 great-great-grandparents who were born in England, and 1 16th Irish because of my great-great-grand Catherine Brady from Athlone. I wasn't sure how tight the prediction would be, how far back it would stretch, whether it would cover ancient African roots, for instance, from those first few humans in caves. I spent a lot of time on websites and chat groups, talking to people that had a bit more of an idea about DNA than me, trying to understand all of this. And eventually it was explained to me that such a sizeable chunk probably related to one of my great-grandparents that most likely one of my great-grandparents was in fact an Eastern European Jew and not, obviously, the person that appeared on the relevant birth certificate. So I persuaded various members of my extended family to take DNA tests and eventually was able to pinpoint where in my tree this had occurred and which of my grandparents actually had a different father to the one that 
that everybody believed that they had. And it was really through that process, which probably took me about four or five years, that I, I learned so much about DNA and how it works and how it's passed on and how we can use it. I did eventually identify my great-grandfather. In fact, I went to his grave and paid my respects last year, which was very special. Let's look now at DNA itself, what it is and how we can utilise it to put our family jigsaws together. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and I hope never to have to say that again. In future, I'll say it stands for do not ask. It's a molecule that carries genetic instructions for the development, functioning, growth and reproduction of all known organisms. It's DNA that makes us who we are as individuals, DNA that determines how each of us looks, the colour of our eyes, the consistency of our earwax, the shape of our liver, the functionality of our brain and so on. And that is as technical as I'm going to get today. Our interest in DNA from a genealogical point of view lies firstly in the fact that it was passed to us by specific and identifiable ancestors. And secondly, that it's possible through DNA profiling to compare the DNA from one individual with another and to identify where there is a family relationship. Everyone has their own unique mix of DNA. No two individuals are precisely the same unless they are identical twins. But we can still share some of our DNA with each other where we share an ancestor. There are different types of DNA tests which examine different things. I'm going to concentrate today on autosomal DNA, which is the main type that is tested by the various different companies. That's what you will be buying on their websites. That's what we use for our purposes. It's the DNA that is passed from ancestors of both sexes to descendants of both sexes. For your interest, the other two types of DNA are Y DNA, which is passed on virtually unchanged from fathers to sons, and mitochondrial DNA, which is passed on only by a mother to her children. I shall only be addressing myself to autosomal DNA today. Imagine Tom's DNA is a bowl of Smarties. Half are red, representing his father, and half are green, representing his mother. At their conception, Tom's children, Joseph and Lucy, receive about half of these Smarties. Well, they don't receive about half. They receive exactly half of these Smarties from him. This is Joseph's mix. And this is Lucy's mix. The law of averages would suggest that about half of what they've received were red and half were green. But they might actually have got slightly more of one colour than the other. And they will have picked up some identical Smarties, but also some different ones. Now imagine Carol's DNA is introduced. Carol's DNA is blue and yellow to represent her mother and father. Half of her DNA to one child and half to the other. It's not ex a quite an accurate picture. You understand this is a little bit difficult to achieve in the kitchen with bowls of Smarties. Some of the Smarties would in fact be the same Smarties and some of them would be different. But you can begin to see that the mix in each bowl is different. As each generation passes, new Smarties will be introduced and a random half of the bowl will be passed on. Lucy meets Jordan and they have a child together. 
So half of Jordan's DNA is mixed with half of Lucy's DNA. in this next generation and then this child meets a partner and half of this child's DNA is passed on to their child that they have with this new partner And so this exercise is repeated through the generations. Eventually, in generations to come, there'll be none of Tom and Carol Smarties left. They'll be reduced by 50% approximately in every generation. So I talked before about 128 ever so many great grandparents and this bowl now represents my DNA and this is my ancestors. So this one here, that's John Baldock. That's the John Baldock born in, ooh, 1710. And then this one, that's Catherine Ann Brady. That's the lady that came from Athlone. And this one, this is William Millward. So if anybody shares this bit of DNA with me, then they must share William Millward with me too. So that's another way to think about it. All of your DNA represents individuals from a time and place that are in your family tree. Don't mind me, I'm just going to eat Great Aunt Eliza. We'll have a quick look now at how DNA is calculated and then reported in test results. Whichever company you take your DNA test with, the results will always include a list of relatives with whom you share some identical DNA and they'll be listed in order of how close a family member they are to you. Parents and children are always at the top of the list if they've tested because you share half of your DNA with your parent and half of your DNA with your child. There is no closer relative. These will be followed by close family and then extended family and then finally distant family, a whole bunch of cousins. In terms of ancestry, which has the largest database of testers in the world, the average British tester probably has around 250 fourth cousins or closer on their list and the average American will have a few thousand on theirs. And those 250 cousins could live anywhere in the world that allows testing. You may find that quite a few of your DNA cousins are American, simply because of the fashion of testing there, and that they're descended from the brothers and sisters of your great-great-grandparents, for instance, who emigrated. The results will also detail precisely how many Smarties you share with each of these people. <laughs> And of course, DNA isn't really measured in Smarties. It's measured in Centimorgans, or CMs for short. And that's little c, capital M, as opposed to centimetres, which is little c, little m. Here's a look again at my list on ancestry. You'll see in this example that I share 2,374 Centimorgans with my sister Maxine. If I click on that link, it will show the likely nature of that relationship. It says 100% sibling. In this instance, I know who she is, but I might not have done. I have worked on some cases of babies who were left as foundlings and have no idea who any of the people are on their list. You'll see that I share slightly more DNA with my maternal uncle than I do with my paternal aunt. That's down to the random distribution of DNA that we've already looked at. And they are both my full relatives, as it happens. So moving from there to using DNA to prove your family tree then, you can already see the DNA is a great tool. I can see straight away that my father is my father. And because my maternal uncle is on my list, that means my mother is also my mother. I can also see as I work down my list of and look at the different family trees of these DNA cousins, I can see that my father's parents 
were both his biologically and likewise with my maternal grandparents. I can see this because I can find people on my list that share ancestors with me on those branches. In fact, there's a common ancestors feature on Ancestry that allows me to see precisely which ancestors I share with another tester. I can then put a, a tick by everyone on my tree that lies between the tester and me, knowing that they are genetically related to me. This person is related to me on my mother's side, and I know that because she doesn't share any ancestry, any DNA with my father, and he's on this system. I speculated initially that we must be related on her father's side, as he was a fen with roots in Wolverhampton, a family that appears in my own tree. Although she hasn't done this on her own tree, using my genealogical skills, I was able to praise her father's family and into my family tree. And this enabled me to prove six generations of my family tree. Using this lovely tool, all the way back to Thomas Fenn in 1779. So I was then able to confer that Christabel is my grandmother, that Teresa is my great-grandmother, and so on, until we get to Thomas, by finding that link between me and LCCO88. I'm going to talk now about clustering and most recent common ancestors, or MRCAs. You can start with the people on the list that you do know and you can recognise as belonging to a branch of your family and you look at their shared matches and you mark all of them with the same coloured spot and give them the name of that branch of your tree. So you can bring together everyone on the Joneses side, which is your mum's father. You can see their Joneses because you found someone who has the right Jones people on their family tree. And you might give them all a yellow spot and call that Jones. And another cluster seems to belong to the Robinson family, which are your mum's mother's people, and you know that, because it turns out that your second cousin Katie has also taken the test, although you haven't spoken to her for years, but there she is on your list with a, a nice photo. So you give her and everyone that you share with her a contrasting coloured spot, pink perhaps, and call that cluster Robinson. This should have taken care of a decent chunk of your DNA matches. And hopefully, what you now have left are some relatively close cousins, sharing at least 50 centimorgans, ideally, with some family trees that you're able to view, but people that you don't currently recognise. Starting with the highest and therefore the closest unknown DNA match, you would cluster them together with the shared relatives that you and they share, give that cluster a third colour and a name that you'll just use for now. I tend to call it by the name of that tester, so that becomes the Fred Blogs cluster for now. And I do that with the next few highest unclustered matches too, so that I have perhaps three more groups of cousins who as yet I don't know how they're related to each other, or to me, or my tester. Our challenge as DNA genealogists is to work that out. The breakthrough in identifying your unknown biological family, whether that's your father, a grandparent, or a great-grandparent, probably not any further back than that, to be honest, the breakthrough will come from establishing how everyone in the Fred Bloggs group is related to each other. And the only way we can do that is by looking at any available family trees, looking at their surnames and geography until we spot the common connections. You should start to notice surnames and geography that they have in common, that they have their roots in the same county, that they have ancestors with the same surnames. This should give you the confidence to look more closely and work out whether and precisely how those people are related to each other. If you discover that Sally, Ted and Gordon 
are all descended from the Mitchell family of Carlisle in the 1850s, then you can make a reasonable assumption that you are too. And this is the kind of tree that I would be drawing together at this point with my unknown clusters. Hopefully, even if we have to start our genealogical trail in America and then take the journey back into the old country in the 1800s, we'll see that they all appear to have descended from the Mitchells of Carlisle in various ways. This cluster can now be renamed from Fred Bloggs to Mitchell. Sometimes we can't place people, they're not a tree, so we might need to send them a message to ask them about their Mitchell family ancestors. Or we might do some sleuthing to try to work out who they might really be. If they have an unusual name, we might be able to work out who they are and draw up their trees ourselves. We then need to carry out that same exercise for the next unknown cluster. We might imagine that that next cluster turns out to be made up of people descended from the Maguires of Killarney in Ireland. What you may now need to do, and I am simplifying this somewhat, is to find the member of the Mitchell family who married a member of the Maguire family and trust that you, or the tester, must sit somewhere underneath that marriage. So I'm going to summarise this section by saying that you need to group together those of your cousins who you do not recognise and then work for as long as it takes to understand how they are related to each other and thus, at least broadly, to you. In an ideal world, you'd have one decent cluster to represent each of your four grandparents. This is going to depend upon whether your cousins have actually taken DNA tests and whether they took them with the same company as you. You can't influence the first of those much, but you can do quite a bit about the second. There are a variety of different testing companies and you need to have your DNA sitting with each one. The good news is that only two insist on you testing with them. The others will accept a free transfer of your DNA from the company you originally tested with. The first place you must test is with Ancestry.com. Depending upon where you live, there might be a different local version of their website, .co.uk or .ca, for instance, which you'll be redirected to. But all the DNA results are displayed on all the versions, so don't let that worry you. Ancestry is vital because it has by far the biggest number of people for you to be matched with, 15 million plus. Then, when you've tested with Ancestry, it's possible to download your raw DNA and transfer it to other company platforms. We recommend that you transfer it to myheritage.com, familytreedna.com, and if you're living in the UK, to livingdna.com. This then ensures that you can have your DNA compared with at least another 5 million testers. It's, it's preferable to pay the small sum on some of those platforms to unlock further matching tools, but it's not essential. If you struggle with your clustering, you will probably have to do this though, so be prepared. Ideally, if you can afford it, you should also take an additional test with 23andMe, because they don't accept transfers from other platforms, and they do host a further 10 million tests. Ancestry don't accept transfers either, incidentally, which is another reason why you need to start with them. And finally, you need to transfer your raw DNA data to GEDmatch.com, which contains tools that no other site does. This is the site that will tell you whether your parents were related to each other, and whether you and a potential half-sibling share a father rather than a mother.
I'm going to pause here and tell you about Sheila's case. Jedmatch really helped me with that. I'm here today to see Judy. Judy's a client of mine. She came to see me a couple of years ago on behalf of her mum, Sheila, to tell me about Sheila's challenge and see if that was something that I might be able to solve for her using DNA. Judy, perhaps you might tell us a little bit about Sheila's story. Hey, sure. So I'm telling the story on behalf of Sheila because sadly she died in 2020. But from being a young woman, she'd always wanted to know who her father was. Um, as she grew up in Manchester and as a small child, she was told that her father had died before she was born. Um, she went to university in London to study mathematics and at that point there was a possibility she might compete in a hockey tournament abroad so she needed a passport. So when she asked her mother, my grandmother, for the documentation, the birth certificate etc, um, she was then told that this story about the father dying before she was born was completely made up and that um, <clears throat> she wasn't going to be told who her father was. So ever since then, and I think she was about 19 or 20 then, she had a burning desire to know who her father was. It was a real, I would say a visceral need for her to fill that gap. Um, in conversation I found out that Louise did this and she was fairly confident she could find out who the father was. <clears throat> and she thought about it for a few days but decided it was definitely she wanted to do something she wanted to do and that she would go ahead so we purchased a DNA kit and she provided a saliva sample posted it off and in due course of course the results came back um, which I then handed over to Louise and she did various techniques on them and basically came back saying it was one of three brothers. Now to tell a little bit more about my mother's history, <clears throat> uh, she was an only child and her mother had a sister who was married to a very wealthy man with a business in the Philippines. So this sister and her family, um, originally four boys of whom one died young, but the three remaining sons lived in the Philippines. Of course for well off English boys of that era, it was out of the question to be educated abroad. So when they were eight, they were all brought across to England and enrolled in a, a minor public school somewhere in Nottinghamshire. So basically, <clears throat> my granny and her brother and sister and these three first cousins grew up together. The four boys all went to school together. The two girls went to a local day school. Um, and they must have just been really grown up like siblings. So when Louise told me <coughs> the name, I remember the surname um, because of, I knew the eldest of these three brothers until he died in his 70s. I remember him when I was a little girl coming round and visiting us. He lived in South Africa at the time. I was absolutely amazed to learn that one of these three sons was the father of my mother. So basically it was a relationship had happened between these two first cousins. Realistically, the DNA doesn't say which brother it is, but um, the youngest would only have been 14, so we've ruled him out. Of the other two, <coughs> one, the eldest, was repeatedly generous to her wedding gifts, left money in a will, all sorts of things like that, and kept in touch with her and in fact with myself and my sisters the rest of his life so we know that Edward was the father although the, the DNA hasn't proven that I think well I know she 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 came to think that um, it was a good thing that her father was actually a man she'd known until he died and in fact he loved her and I, I can remember him when we were running around the garden as little girls watching us 
and he obviously loved us and it must have been quite hard for him not to be able to acknowledge these three granddaughters as his um, but she was immensely relieved and happy to find out because she felt this hole she'd felt all her life had been filled in what was interesting from my point of view in, in undertaking the task was that when I started to look at Sheila's DNA results, I had a lot of genetic matches to her maternal family. And then where I should have had paternal family, there was a bit of a... I mean, there was some material there, but not much. And I thought, this is a bit peculiar, really. Sheila was um, more or less entirely British in her ethnicity. So you would normally expect to see quite a lot of paternal genetic fa ancestral family and I just there wasn't anything there and it was almost a almost an instinct that made me use the GED match tool which is called are your parents related to look at, at Sheila to look at her DNA and it came back to say that her parents were first cousins and I have to say that's one of the first times when I've used that tool that I actually got a positive result so I was quite excited then because it it explained why I wasn't finding lots of paternal family because mm -hmm. half of Edward's family <clears throat> was the same family but I was able to find Edward's father's family within Sheila's um, genetic ancestry and that's how we worked out which side of the cousins it must be. Yes, it was um, amazing, really amazing. Finally, I'm going to tell you something about DNA tools, which will help you to see where you or your tester fits into the Mitchells of Carlisle tree or the Maguires of Killarney tree or the Fred Bloggs tree or whichever it is that you're working on. Essentially, you need to be able to calculate the precise relationship that you share with the individuals in that cluster and therefore where you must sit in their tree. And you do this by studying how much exactly DNA you share with them and then considering that in relation to your respective ages and generations. There are wonderful tools that will really help with this, all available free on the DNA Painter website. I couldn't do my work half as well without them. There's a shared Senti Morgan's project tool that lists all the likely relationships between two individuals in order of likelihood and also provides a chart for those who prefer a more visual presentation and we'll have a look at that now. This is the wonderful DNA Painter resource and particularly here we have the shared Sandy Morgan project which is currently on version 4 because they're working on it all the time and making it better and better and better. So if you share for example 229 Sandy Morgans with someone and you type that into the window there at the top and let's say that they're broadly the same age as you and you've established that you're probably second cousins it says here you're unlikely to be half great great aunt and uncle or niece and nephew if you're the same age you could be a half cousin once removed just about yeah you're unlikely to be a first cousin twice removed if you're broadly the same age so there are other possible relations it could be further down and, and you'll be able to see that there so that is a really useful tool when you're trying to establish if I share 2374 centimorgans like I share with my sister it says that she's 94% likely to be my sibling 6% my niece or nephew and there is in fact a chart for those who prefer to look at things visually that highlights those boxes that, it, that somebody showing that DNA is most likely to be in relation to you. This is the other really great tool the DNA Painter offers. It's called What Are The Odds? And it enables you to put in the details of the 
DNA matches that you've plotted into a family tree and then it'll tell you where your person, the person that tests against these individuals, where they probably would fit. So you've seen earlier the fictitious family tree that I drew for Sally, Ted and Gordon, the Mitchells of Carlisle. This is how they fit into that family tree. And this is the amount of centimorgans that they each shared with Janice. So you can see at the top of the screen here that this has been prepared for Janice, who was born in 1932. And my question is, where does Janice fit into this tree? So I have manually, using this tool, added children, added their date of birth, added their children's children, and so on. So to prepare and make the tree on what are the odds look like that one that we looked at on paper. And what I would then do is press this button here, suggest hypotheses, and it will tell me where it thinks Janice fits in this tree. So I've pressed the hypotheses button and this is what it's now looking like. I should tell you that um, I have made a few judicial deletions before I <laughs> before I showed you because it, it's a little bit complicated if you don't. So what it's basically suggesting is that the, it's given a score of 14 to the possibility that Janice um, is descended from Joseph through a sibling to Edward. It's given a 3% score to the possibility that Janice is descended from a half-sibling to Joan from Jack. Which is, you know, again, not impossible. Then it's giving a score of 230 to the possibility that Sarah had a half-child with somebody. A child who was a half-sibling to Jack and that Janice might fit off there. But the two that it prefers, and this would this would be the same for Tom, Alice, or Henry and George if I'd added them as well. The most likely hypothesis eight and hypothesis twelve, which is worth three hundred and forty points, is that Janice is the great grandchild of either Tom or Alice or one of their siblings. And if we go a little bit further down we can see it tells us that in case we couldn't work it out is that 8 and 12 are the most highest ranked 8 and 12 and then if we come to the bottom and it shows us the different hypotheses 8 and 12 here it shows you why places there is in the position it does because in hypothesis 8 Ted there's a 50% chance that he would be a second cousin once removed because of the amount of DNA that he shares Sally, a 46% chance that she fits in there. Gordon, a 29% chance. And it's calculated that that's the best odds altogether. What it doesn't tell us at this point <coughs> is which of Tom or Alice or Henry or George you aren't shown, which is the next generation that we need to concentrate on. But it does give us an indication where now we need to start in our tree with these individuals here, Tom and Alice, to find out who their partners were and what children they had and see if we can get any closer to finding some more genetic matches. You'll remember that we were hoping to find the marriage of a uh, Maguire with a Mitchell. So if Tom or Alice had to have married a Maguire, we'd be very happy that we would then know which was our next generation that we wanted to work on in our family tree. I don't expect you to remember all this. I'm just showing you that it's a fabulous tool that really helps you to place individuals when you don't really know where you fit into their family. So that's on the DNA Painter resource. So that was a whistle stop tour of DNA and how we might use it to solve some of our genealogical puzzles. There are some blogs and some case studies on my website that you might also find useful. 
That's www.findingfamilies.co.uk and I'd be happy to uh, offer you any advice as you go through your own DNA journey. Thanks very much.